All right, so this is our part two on um, circumcision. And here we're going through a uh, book of the beginnings, um, Gerald Macy's first uh, volume, the first of the three major works, a book of the beginnings, natural Genesis and ancient Egypt, light of the world. Now, there's some very interesting connections with uh, Sukkot, Sukkot, which is this particular holy day, and um, circumcision. Now, here um, in this uh, this uh, page right here, what page we're on? Page uh, 24, I think this is the second volume. Now, Appian, Appian and Josephus, some of y'all may be familiar with that, um, what Appian and Josephus, and then Josephus went against Appian. And there's a very interesting kind of interpretation. For, look, look at this right here, the Sabu. There's ones that were known as the Sabu in ancient Egypt, the Sabu. Now, here he says the subject has to be further dealt with. And this is where we agree that this matter about circumcision, there's many moving parts in this whole issue and this whole subject matter concerning um, circumcision. Just to review and refresh, let us bring up these um, word picks right here. As you know, this is what we began off addressing, this famous and popular image of um, circumcision going back to the sixth dynasty of ancient Egypt to a tomb of one named Ankh-Mahor, Ankh-Mahor, and this was found in his, um, in his tomb. Now, we didn't address this before, but this might be a good as time as any to address this, this particular image. There's a, there's a, certain, there's, there's a certain narration, a narrative that goes with this particular image. But this is a popular and ancient image that proves that the ancient Egyptians practiced circumcision. That they practiced circumcision for religious reasons as well as for hygienic reasons. And today we're learning some of these hygienic reasons, especially in connection with certain disease, as well as um, lowering the rates of infection among uh, heterosexual African men by 60%, as well as UTIs, which is urinary, ur urinary tract infections, and um, cerve uh, cervical cancer cervical cancer um, and now see this is shocking because if this means that uncircumcision contributes to these diseases not in everybody who's so-called uncircumcised but in a general medical and hygienic sense this totally re, um, re, uh, uh, reorientates the whole subject matter. Now, here's what's ironic about circumcision, which also inspired us to, to do this particular study, although we wanted to present this uh, previously, is that um, when speaking about circumcision, there are some states in America which are trying to ban circumcision. This is a whole, this is, this is a part of a whole diabolical agenda from the so-called new normal. There's this whole new normal thing. Part of this new normal thing is the homosexual rights, so forth and so on, gay rights. And that, that's just one of the many strands of this. And now this is not about judging personal people because a lot of folks have a lot of stories to tell. And some of these stories are true. There's people who have been abused. And this is what we're speaking about. This is what the good news is the good news about, the true good news of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. But now on this matter of circumcision, let's return to Gerald Macy's first book. And the first book on Egyptology, the major volume on Egyptology that is known as a book of the beginning. So here we're in volume two. In volume two, Macy addresses and sorry about the windows a little bit slow. We got a lot of programs running. This is kind of like, you know, how we do it. You understand? Multitasking, but multi 
multitasking of the information yeah, by comparing, contrasting, with says, study to show oneself approved to God as a workman and need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth to really get to the, the, the real ground and the root. Now, here Macy says, here Macy says, and we're, we're roughly around right here, Macy says that the subject has to be further dealt with. And meanwhile, it must suffice to say that sabu not only means to circumcise, but sabu also meant to castrate. This was the earlier form of excision, excision, practice in the worship of the genetrix. Now, now, who is the genetrix? The genetrix, well, they say matrix, and they say dominatrix. You might be familiar with those kind of tricks, at least in, in word. But we're going to show you an image of the modern genetrix. The modern genetrix. You all might call it the trick, bitch. You understand? But that is, that's the goddess that's ruling today. This goddess has been given breathing um, new life, and the particular goddess that is ruling today is this particular. We're not talking about the, the good mother. We're speaking about the bad mother. And this is not against women, you know, because many of the women, you know, look at, look at the female genital mutilation which is going on today. And what is so shocking when you start to study and investigate that particular story of female genital um, mutilation you find that in this particular cult that it's many of the women who are the ringleaders of this uh, cult that is circumcising, circumcising girls and women and, and young girls, cutting off their clitoris. And some of the pictures about this are really just, just totally shocking. And um, we're not... We're not up to really showing that, and perhaps ones and ones would even try to ban it if we did try to show you some of the pictures. But they're out there. You know, was the aftermath, you know, how they damage and destroy the, the woman's um, sexual anatomy. And who does it serve? You understand? Know does it serve the fatherhood? Does it serve the male? Or does it serve this warped? this warped um, um, witchcraft that is basically another name for it today is feminism, is, is feminism. And although some may not like to acknowledge that, you understand, that is the fact. This modern form of feminism, behind it is a whole heap of dirty witchcraft. Believe it or not, like it or not. The thing that really amazes some of us is um, back in the 60s when black people, men and women, was getting their, 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 their liberation on, that the, the, white, the white mistress would be able to come to the black woman and divide and destroy the black power movement. That's exactly what happened. Um, blacktown.net, you can go there. We also have some blacktown.net videos of, for the church, of, uh, uh, or the church of, for men only. And some think that this idea doesn't have too much traction because some of the whipped men figure that, um, well, how will the, the, woman will never, the woman will never go along with that. The woman will never go along with that. The true women are crying out for change as well. Now, let's, let's get that genetrix right here. Um, this is, uh, we'll use the, Nicki Man, uh, the little Kim versus Nicki Minaj. Now, if you study some of the, the archaeology and you start to look at what they found buried deep in the ground, what's so amazing is that this same sort of pose, let's bring this up right here, this same sort of pose is what they find so-called prehistoric man was worshiping. This is your goddess. For all of you all that talk about, you know, the so-called goddess, goddess, and divas, divas. This is your diva. Diva basically is a, is a, is a female god, is, a, is a, a, a goddess. So the word diva, you understand, and there's a lot of ignorant people, a lot of the ignorant women 
think this is something to be aspired to. But you have to remember, well, there's a whole generation who were brought up without any sense of truth, without any true sense of God. If they were brought up in a so-called religion, there was a counterfeit version of um, Christianity, in other words, a, a whitewash version or perversion of Christianity. Let's move this over over here. So this is your genetrix. This is your genetrix. Believe it or not, that this got so bad, even in some parts of Africa, this same old-time goddess, this is the goddess worship, this is a typical goddess worship, that some of the women, in reaction to it, began to declitorize or declit other women, female genital mutilation, because they felt that if the woman had her clitoris, you, you know what I'm saying, that they would basically be sexually uncontrollable. Now, in the Arab world, it takes on a different kind of mythos among Arabs and Mohammedans than it does in some other parts of Africa, you understand, coming from the old African um, religions and the old African um, um, worships, let's put it like that, worship. So this is your genetrix. We just took us a little moment to, to, to want to show you this. But this is your genetrix. So now, understanding this, having this particular image, let's continue with where we were in, um, in G. Macy's, uh, Gerald Macy's uh, a, a Book of the Beginnings concerning the original form of circumcision. Now, the original form of circumcision was basically castration. You know there's a verse in the New Testament, I mean, that's based on the Old Testament, a lot of verses actually, but there's a particular verse that talks about, um, let us bring this up right here, that talks about this uh, 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 Sukkot. While that's coming up, let's get this verse right here. It's um, Amos. It's in the book of Amos. And many people use this verse to try to say, well, the... The six-pointed star is this star. And see, all of them are wrong. Why all of them are wrong is because they don't understand the context of the ancient mythology. You said that the six-pointed star is actually, is actually the star that is spoken of in Amos right here. And if they were to do a little more diligence, they would actually come to the, the understanding that that is not at all what this area of scripture is talking about in Amos chapter Amos chapter 6 well actually Amos chapter 5 Amos chapter 5 in Amos chapter 5 Yahweh our God Father is lamenting over Israel in other words Jah is lamenting over the, the condition of black people the day of the Lord is mentioned. Then the third part here of this chapter, chapter 5 of Amos, it speaks about worship without righteousness, Jehovah's abomination. Worship without righteousness. Worship without being rightly aligned or in, in, the, in the, uh, the legal. See, now righteousness, what is righteousness? Righteousness is being justified or being in a right legal status with the Almighty. The Bible teaches that our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, that our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua, he is our righteousness, that Yeshua is our righteousness. Yeshua is our righteousness, that we don't have any right. He's our right alignment. He's, he symbolizes right alignment. So because of our faith in him, that we have grace before the Almighty. And in this, uh, grace is like a probationary period to work out our salvation. I know your churches don't teach that. And that's part of the problem. That's why there's more and more Christians popping up every day, and the world is becoming more and more polluted with, 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 with demonology, you understand, with wickedness. And more and more people say, well, I go to church. I go to church. I tithe. This is why this area of Scripture, let us show you this right here. Move this right here. This area of Scripture, you see this right here, it says that worship without righteousness it says, uh, Jehovah's abomination. He says, I hate, I despise your feast days. I will not smell your solemn assemblies. 
It says, though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. I will not accept them, neither will I regard the peace offerings of, of your fat beasts. Take away from me, take away from me, it says, take away from me the noise of thy songs. I will not hear the melody of thy vows. It's like all this, all this uh, reprobate, this cheap music, this so-called gospel, this modern, light and easy and pop gospel music that's going on. And they call that God's music. But let judgment run down as waters. This is where Dr. King got it from. And righteousness as a mighty stream, let, but let judgment. Interesting now, when we look at this is what King actually said, let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have ye offered to me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, O house of Israel? In other words, has the black church really been offering to the true God, to its true God and Father, our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, sacrificing the offerings in the wilderness of North America for the past 40 years. O house of Israel, O Ethiopian Hebrews, aren't you like the Ethiopian unto me, O children of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Molech and Kiyun, your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourself, the star of your God, which he made to yourself. Therefore, will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus or Damascus, saith Yahweh, whose name is the God of hosts, or Elohim Sabaot. Now, it's from this right here that a lot of people say, a lot of people say, well, you see this area right here? They say the star is the six-pointed star. Some say, well, the six-pointed star is evil, you understand, because it's a six-pointed star. Don't believe the hype. What a lot of them don't have or don't know is basically what they don't know. And what they don't know is the half of the stories that they haven't been told. And by us studying Macy right here, we're going to touch on this other half of the story, and you're going to see the connection. You understand, when it says the tabernacle of, of Molech, it's called the Sikut, the Sikut of Molech, of your Molech, of your king, or that owl that they worship in the Bohemian Grove. And Kiyun, Kiyun is the mother goddess, the degenerate old mother goddess, your images. And now the star of your god, which he made to yourselves, is the five-pointed star upside down that makes the goat's head. Now, when we look here and what Macy has, Macy said that there was an earlier form of excision or circumcision that was practiced in the worship of the genetrix or the worship of, the, of, 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 of pussy worship, basically, you know, worship of the VJ, as, as, as Harpo, the female pharaoh, says, or Oprah. By the Sabians, the Sabians is another name for the Ethiopians. So see how Ethiopia is still in the mix of this who offered up their manhood to the motherhood. Do you, do you see this right here? They offered up their what? Manhood to the motherhood. They offered up their manhood to the motherhood. Sabu is the name of an ox or a bullock, an ox or a bullock, the castrated animal. So now when we look at how to make a slave, what does it say? Let the man be all physically strong but mentally weak. He's an ox or a bullock. He's a castrated animal and of the eunuch, and of the eunuch. So when you study the etymology of Sabu, you'll find it's now Seb, who is Cronus, was the castrator of his father. Now we look in the so-called mythology, and people say, well, do you know mythology? Well, then look at the seal of the, your state. What state are you in? Look at, it, look at the governmental seal of the governmental seat of your state. And what you'll find is the same Greco and Roman gods. Why did this Christian nation choose these Greco Roman gods? Whatever state you are in the United States, go and look at your state seal. And you'll find, you know, you'll find some goddesses there. Look at your state buildings. You'll find some, go outside your court building. Who is that woman right there? Is that Mary? 
is that is that Jesus mama? You understand? Who is that woman? She's a false goddess. You understand? So here we have to understand this very carefully. Though they pretend themselves to be Christians, what they really worship, you understand, are these same false goddesses like Cronus said right here, who was the castrate of his father. Then you have Sabutes. Sabutes means to exercise the genitals. Now this goes beyond a lot, a long way beyond, a very long way beyond circumcision, because a test. Test is the testicle. The test is the testicle and the very self. So the testicle also means the very self. So the very self, the manhood was 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 offered up as a sacrifice to the motherhood. You understand? And here's where we got the Sebu and here's the link and connection and the how to make a slave also touches touches on this, squarely on this. Let the black man be strong as an ox or like a bull, but let him be weak in mind. Let him be weak-minded. And who was put over that particular function of keeping the black man in uh, a certain, um, certain so-called weakened state? Well, according to Wooly Lynch, according to Wooly Lynch, it will be the black woman. You understand? It would be the black woman who would be responsible for keeping the sorry nigger, you understand, in that strong as an ox, like a castrated animal, or like a eunuch, you understand, like a eunuch. And I guess the eunuchs now today would be the effeminate, the effeminate, the narcissistic, the effeminate, the bisexual, the heteros, the bisexual, the homosexual, as Francis Cress Welsing spoke about in that amazing the accurate chapter in her book. I mean, she has a chapter, for Dr. Francis Cress Welsing has a chapter in her book, and let me give you the title so you can look it up and read this chapter. It'll make everything clear. The Politics Behind Black Male Passivity, Effeminization, Bisexuality, and Homosexuality, page 81. It's on page 81. It's like they're trying to send me some so-called spyware. They're trying to stop this reason right here, send some spyware and everything to this machine. But let's, let's continue on. You know what I'm saying? Let us continue on. Now, the next, the next quote, let's get the next quote in Macy's book. And, and you're going to see how all of this concerning circumcision and concerning the ancient mystery, this is why it says um, to, to to one who who has wisdom, to one who has been initiated, they can understand the so-called mark of the beast. You know what I'm saying? They can understand the true spiritual application of this sign, the so-called mark of the beast. But Macy has a little bit more. Let's see if this thing is going to function, or we got to reboot, or we're going to have to reboot this right here. You understand? But until it until it moves, we're on page what is four ninety four ninety five right here. But now, as you go further here, let's just stay on this page. The disease sabatosis was called the blotch of Egypt. Now, notice that in the next quote that we was about to deal with under circumcision, it takes us to Joshua chapter five, verse three. So when we get to Joshua chapter five, um, verse three. There's something that's known as the reproach of Egypt, or as Macy has right here, the disease, sabatosis, the blotch of Egypt, and the leprosy. And the leprosy were evidently attributed to the sabu in this sense. And the Lord God of Sabaoth was thus not only the deity of the seventh day, or seven stars, but of the self-mutilated. Then it has the Gali, the Atis priests, who became eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. You see, Christ in our Bible says some very, very interesting, some very interesting matters are said by Christ. And we get these poor misinterpretations by our pastors and so-called preachers because they never would know the true meaning of it because it has not been given to them in plantation Christianity. You have to come out of Babylon. Now, here the meaning of the word chetim, of chetim, 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 like we say, 
Machtem, is identical with the Egyptian Ketem, Ketem, which means to shut, to lock, and seal. So when we talk about the seal, the seven seals, this is a, the act of word. So we see the Hebrew and the Egyptian is one and the same. But they say that the Egyptians were Hamites and the Hebrews were Semites, but they're both speaking the same language. All right? It has the meaning of seal, to seal up, and to set a seal upon. The root is chet, meaning to shut, to seal, and a signet. This will throw light on the form of the word as chetin, to give one's daughter in marriage. So now we have the chetin. Chetin means to give one's daughter in marriage, to circumcise, to be a bridegroom, etc. Each is a form of sealing. Chet is likewise, chet also means to cut. And cutting is the sealing by circumcision. Now, chet is cut and seal. To seal is to cut and the seal is cut. The circumcised child is called metaphorically a bridegroom of blood. Now, doesn't this now help us, give us some background, um, historical idea of why Zipara, Zipora would say that thou art a bloody husband to me because of the matter of the circumcision, what she was pointing to. The circumcised child is metaphorically a bridegroom of blood, that is, sealed, cut and sealed with red, with blood. Now, Abin Ezra says that the Jewish woman call a son when circumcised the bridegroom. So in Judaism, the Jewish woman call a son, a male. When he's circumcised, he's the bridegroom. Now, further, the seal and the signet, the signet ring, het, is a ring. And the excised portion, this means the cut-off portion of the male, is a circle, a wedding ring of the particular rite with which the covenant of the bridegroom is contracted and the sacred bond is sealed. Hmm. So ask him now, where, where does the wedding ring come from? You know, that's what we showed you earlier, the, the zuria, the zuria, you understand, or the circle, or the round. Let's bring that out for those who might not have seen it in the last lecture. Let's bring up the, the zuria, you understand? And when you look at this... Um, Zoria, right here. Let us let us uh, delineate this. Move this over right here. I think it's uh, back um, on one of these pages back here. Some examples right there of circumcision, of the different modalities. Here we go right here. You see this, this is the zoria or the circumference going around. So what we have here is some particular types and rituals. This is why when we showed from the beginning, there's a true type of circumcision, which is not cutting off, but it's done on the eighth day where the cord is split like in grafting, and, and, and if you graft plants. This is why Paul would say, if the wild olive tree, to speak of the other Jews, for example, the converted Khazars, if they could be grafted in, then the original branch is broken off. It should not amaze you that the original branches, which are broken off, can also be grafted. In other words, if you can graft something that is wild by nature, that wasn't under our covenant, into the covenant, as the other Jews or the OJs have been grafted, in that sense, into this holy covenant, then how be it that the natural branches, even if broken off, cannot be grafted back into its own vine? and its own root. So when we're speaking about Judaism as Ethiopian Hebrews and black Hebrews and elect Rastafari, don't let it be something strange to you. It's just the half of the story that they didn't tell you. You understand? Now, the other half of the story right here that we're talking about is the seal and the chet being the ring, being synonymous with the cutoff portion of the male, which would be a circle, a wedding ring of the particular rite and ritual with which the covenant of the bridegroom is contracted and the sacred bond is sealed. You see, nowadays when people talk about the ring, 
you know, getting a ring, or I got a ring, I was given this wedding ring, so forth and so on, I'm getting married, and blah, 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 blah. These are customs that people don't even know where they come from. They just start doing it willy-nilly. You know what I'm saying? Willy-nilly. Don't even know what it means. You understand? And definitely, most of these customs, you don't find them in the Bible. They don't even pretend that they are biblical. You understand? Such as white wedding and the red wedding ring and all of this. But as we begin to study, we see those true roots. Now, the word circumcision implies an exercise circle. The word circumcision means a circle that has been cut off. Also, in Egyptian, the form of hetan or hetan is a ring. So the word hetan is a ring that also links, so we have this idea being verified. The right was symbolical, and the het ring is hieroglyphical. It is the type of reproduction, and if we read the matter hieroglyphically, the covenant of circumcision was instituted as a right of reproduction a swearing in of the male to reproduce his kind, and a protest against all unnatural practices of the earlier time. So in the Bible where this, this covenant is given to Abraham, it's an abrogation, a denial of all the earlier former types because Abraham symbolizes the fatherhood. Symbolized now the fatherhood has been identified. Now the father is known. In other words, it should not amaze you, but it probably does, that this you are the father, you are not the father, nobody knows who the father is, and all the baby mama dramas. It is nothing new. We are returning in the last days. We are returning to the first days, and now when we look at documentation the first days, we'll say this sounds a lot like what's going on today. All these are natural practices of the present time. So the proper period, the proper period of the ceremony with the primitive, the first races, was that of puberty. In other words, at the age of 13. When the lessons were taught, as in the Maori, the Maori young man making, or their rites of passage. Now the Hebrew circumcision for the second time, which we're about to touch on right here, this is why we decided to bring up this book of the beginnings, probably denotes a second mode. And it says the one in which the circle was exercised for the first time in the solar cult. In other words, the solar cult is, is the faith of Abraham, Father Abraham. Abraham is the solar, not the lunar. The lunar is, is the old goddess and the mother goddess and her mutilated, effeminate son. You understand? Now we are going into the, when the fatherhood is identified and is recognized, it's symbolic of Abraham. But it's key that Macy says here that the one in which the circle was exercised for the first time in the solar cult, because we are going now to um, Joshua. In Joshua, there's a slightly different form of circumcision at Gilgal, rolling, rolling, Gilgal, than was done under Abraham that we have in Genesis. Now, hence the foreskins heaped in the circle of Gilgal as the ring of reproduction. Now, the Jews identify the second circumcision with the word peria, peria, or peria, now applied to a secondary part of the right. Now, the numerical value of the letters in the word peria amount by gematria, by gematria to 365. And that being the number of the negative precepts of the law in the Hebrew, there's three hundred, there, there is six hundred and thirteen, right? And there are three hundred and sixty-five negative commandments, and there are two hundred and forty-eight. And the two hundred and forty-eight and the three sixty-five together make six hundred and thirteen commandments, laws, statutes, judgments, precepts and so forth, and so on. So now we have the 365, and that number is a number of the Hebraic or Judaic negative precepts or the negative commands in the law. It is said that the circumcised person is to be considered to have fulfilled all those precepts, all those precepts, the 365. Now the number identifies the right with the solar year. 
the solar year, as did the 12 stones that were set up in Gilgal, which came to supersede, to supersede the Sabian lunar reckoning, the lunar reckoning. It all has to do with time, my brothers and sisters, together with some of the older the older ceremonies. Now let's just go through this and go to the next mention of um, circumcision right here. So we're just looking through here and going to some of the significant uh, mentions of um, circumcision that's found in Macy's uh, first book, A Book of the Beginning. Now here we have another reduced deity might be recovered in the person of Elijah. Eliyahu, Elijah. Elijah, who will be referred to hereafter. Now, here we have the Hebrew Baruch Haba. Baruch Haba. Baruch Haba means blessed is he that cometh. Baruch Haba. Uh, Shemo Yahweh, blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, Baruch Haba is used by the Jews as a salutation to the child when it is brought into the room to be circumcised. In other words, when they circumcise the child in Orthodox Judaism on that eighth day, they salute the child by saying, Baruch Haba, which is part of the phrase, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. But they say the first part, Baruch Haba. Now the word Haba contains various mystic and occult meanings. The value of its letters in Hebrew is considered to amount by gematria to the number eight. The eight and the eighth is the day of circumcision. And we've touched on this in part one, and we find this in, in Genesis chapter 17 at around verse uh, 14. So we find that the eighth is the day of circumcision, the salutations connected with the child's coming on the eighth day to be circumcised. Now, by another, uh, another science called the uh, no, notar, notaricon, notaricon uh, we can now take these letters, HBA, which are to be the initials of the three words which translate, Behold, Elijah cometh. Behold, Elijah cometh. Or the Hinne Bo, the Hinne Bo Eliyahu. The Hinne Bo Eliyahu. In other words, Hinne, Behold, and Neho Bo, he comes, Eliyahu, Elijah. The Jews are said to suppose that Elijah enters the chamber along with the child to take the seat, the seat that's left vacant for him in the double chair. Now notice in the Hebrew, um, Orthodox Hebrew ceremonies, they have two seats. There are two seats, and we don't have a, a picture of these two seats, and they call the symbolic chair for Elijah. It's a double seat. Right, and it's a double chair, and the 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 Hebrews and the Jews they they exclaim that this is the seat of the prophet Eliyahu, Elias. This is the seat of the prophet Elijah. Eliyahu, Elijah is the center of a large number of Hebraic traditions. Now, when we take this um, Elijah, what's interesting about the name Elijah, if you write it down, and you write E. Um, or you, let, you write it in the Hebrew, but you write it even in the English, El, El, Elijah would take out the J and put a Y. So we have Eliyah, or you can contract the Y sound, and you have Eliah, E-L-I-A-H. Now, Hebrew is written from what? From, from right to left. Now, if you read Eliyah from left to right, or what they call it in reverse, we have Hila. We have Hila. So this is also another level that we're going to touch on, but this is interesting when we start to put this all together and the fact that Eliyahu or Elijah is the sense of a large number of Hebraic traditions and this identification of him with one who comes and with the number eight, it appears likewise to indicate that he is a form of the god Tahuti or Tahut or an earlier suit anibus, or the suit anibus, or suit and anibus, or anpu, suit, suit and pu. Now, suit was the announcer 
of the goddess of the seven stars. So now when we look in Amos, in Amos chapter 5, and it speaks about your molech, this molech was the, the suit that was cast out that becomes in the Hebrew the suit on or the Satan. In the earlier mode, suit or shet was the announcer of the goddess. Now, Bamarinya, when we say sait, sait actually also means female. So suit or sait or shet was the announcer of the goddess or the diva of the seven stars as the one who came annually. Now, Tahuti or Tat or Tut, he, he is the one who superseded him and was the messenger, the voice or the logos of the seven gods, the manifesto of the pleroma or the mulat, the fullness, and the completer of the ogdaod or the completer of the eighth. He was the lord of the eighth or the eighth to the seventh. Now, haba, which means he that cometh, is the name of Tehut's, Ibis, the Ibis or the Ibis of the of Tehuti, that was his name in the in Egyptian. Haba, Haba is the Egyptian form of the Ibis, the Ibis or the the stork like the stork like uh, Nile Valley um, bird. Now the word also signifies messenger and the coming or the returning one. Now, Elijah commences as the messenger who announces the prophecy to Ahab. Tat, or Tehut, superseded Sut. That is Bar, or Baal, in Egypt. And Elijah, Eliyahu, is portrayed as the great opponent of Baal in Israel. So when we look at now the Hebraic, we have Elijah, he opposed Baal and the Balaam. But then who was the goddess of that order? It was Jezebel. Jezebel was that particular goddess of that order. So now we have from Egypt to the Hebrews, and now to understand the Hebraic, we have to go to the mysteries in ancient Egypt. Now Tehut was the scribe of the gods. And eight years after his ascension into heaven, on a chariot of fire, Eliyahu, or the biblical Elijah, he sent a letter of reproof to Jehoram, king of, e king of Judah. Isn't this interesting? That eight years after Elijah had went up to heaven in the chariot of fire, or some would say on the, the flying saucer, you understand, the spaceship, some would, would, would think of it, but that's not far beyond the Almighty if we would understand that we live in a very big and expanding universe. But eight years after Elijah ascended, he would send a letter of reproof to the then king of Judah named Jehoram. How interesting is that? So where did he really go? And what really happened? Now, uh, Macy goes on to give a very interesting connection to, to, um, to John the Baptist. What we're going to do right now is we're going to go past that, that John the Baptist part, you understand, and just keep on some of the verses right here on um, circumcision. You understand, that was circ that's, that's circumpola. This is circumstances. Now, here is circumcision again. Now, this brings us closer to where, where we are at right now. You understand the Popol Vuh? The Popol Vuh, he has a reference here. It says that the Israelites, the Israelites collected on a mountain on the westward side of Jordan when Joshua performed the rite of circumcision at the hill, what's known in the Bible as the Hill of Foreskins. In Egyptian mythological astronomy, the ki, or the chi, or ki, the ch, the chi, is the hill or high earth. Now, there were four of these that were called the four supports of heaven at the four corners of the world. Now, the corner is called the kab. In the Ethiopic, this is where we where we can decipher kirub, the kirub, the kab, and the part and the article p is the. Now the Egyptian ki p kab 
it would denote the hill at the corner or one of the four supports of the heaven and the cardinal the cardinal points of the circle the cardinal points of the cipher now as we move move on a little bit further here we want to find a particular reference this is interesting some of the jewish legends about um about moses how moses some some say in rabbinical tradition moses was born um circumcised how moses was born circumcised that's what it, it's it said right there um now here is circumference um here's circumference too here is um circumcision right here it says by the command of god he like abram is to introduce the rite of circumcision to be practiced by his descendants he is also commanded to offer a sacrifice to the lord you understand or to yahweh now here we have something that is very interesting um as well from josephus Josephus, one of the early uh, Jewish uh, historians, here it says, it says that um, this too can be correlated when we know the nature of the tower, speaking about the tower of, the, of Babel, and the meaning of the deluge or the flood. The covenant of Abram, it follows the flood of Noah, or the flood of Noah, and the end of the times of the ten patriarchs. Now, the bow or the circle in heaven is one witness of the of a new covenant. And the bow or the circle, the kest in the heavens, is one of the witnesses of the new covenant. And circumcision is actually another. Now, this was connected with the establishing of the circle of the 12 signs, the 12 zodiacal signs, as illustrated by the 12 stones of Gilgal on the hill of foreskins. There was a, there was a tradition that was known to the Apostle Paul that Abram, in being circumcised, was to become ear, the ear of the world. Now, if you don't want to believe us, check Rabbi um, Jehuda or Yehuda HaKodash or HaKadosh, who said, so great is circumcision that but, for, that but for it, the Holy One, blessed be he, Baruch Hu, would not have created the world. For it is said, but for my covenant of the circumcision, I would not have made day and night and the ordinances of heaven and earth. Now, Abraham was not called perfect till he was circumcised. It is as great as all the other commandments put together. Behold, the blood of the covenant which Yahweh hath made with you above all these words. Now, the Jewish rite and the Hebraic rite of circumcision by exercising the prepuse, the prepuse covering, it belongs to the latter phase, the latter phase of the solar religion or the biblical religion, in other words, with the worshipers of the sun or star as the child of the virgin mother, which preceded the cult. All of this precedes the cult or the culture of fatherhood, when fatherhood now assumes and resumes its rightful role within human society. And we're at such a point now where fatherhood ha has lost its rightful role in society. So the circumcision was by castration, right? The former, the old circumcision of the virgin mother and the mother goddess and the divas, this circumcision was by castration or by the longitudinal slit, which the Maori and the Fijians, the Fijian tribes, they perform this rather than by cutting off the foreskin. So you can kind of imagine, 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 imagine that. And it says right here, here's a quote. It says, worship not the sun, whose name is Adonai, 
whose name is Kodesh, and who also has names occult and not to be revealed in the world. This Adonai will choose for himself a people and congregate a crowd. Then Jerusalem shall be built up for a refuge, a city of the abortive, who shall circumcise themselves with the sword, dash their own blood against their faces, and adore Adonai. Now, time was when Adon, who in Egypt is the Aten, the earlier form of Atum, as son of the mother, was represented as the unfertile the mutilated, the emasculated son, which set from the land of life, needing all the help that could be given typically from his worshipers who offered him their own emblems of virility in his affete condition, his affet condition or feminized condition. This is very, very interesting when we put How to Make a Slave in a Chapter by Francis Cress Welsing, um, the chapter in her book, The ISIS Papers, which is appropriately named The Politics Behind Black Male Passivity of Feminization, Bisexuality and Homosexuality. Now, one say, well, how come all these blacks are homosexual, this homosexual male, homosexual rise among blacks? Well, we have to first go back to where it began. It began with black male passivity or pucidity. You understand? Then it went to a feminization. Then it went to bisexuality and homosexuality. And all of this is based on how to make a slave or let's make a slave. Now, that was before there was any tread in, any, any tread in the egg. Before the fatherhood of the Elohim or the fatherhood of the gods had been founded. Before the fatherhood of the gods had been founded. Found it. So we need to understand the motherhood, the fatherhood in its sociological, you understand, because what we're going through presently in society with the male and the female, the female and male conflicts and confusion is all based on an earlier type. You understand, it's all based on an earlier type. Another quote right here, a brief quote right here, is that um, he is the father, the creator, the son, who is still virile. He is the father, the creator, the son, who is still, well, let's go to the top of this paragraph right here. It says, Atum, Atem, which in the Hebrew is the Adon, is called the soul of the souls reserved in the West in whose following is the reserved soul, the engendered of the gods, who provided him with shapes. Inexplicable is the Genesis. It is the greatest of secrets, Genesis, the beginning. Thou art the good peace of the deceased, O greater father of the gods, incorruptible. This is said when the god, with hands drooping, sets from the land of life. Yet he is accredited with power to beget the soul in the mummies of the dead awaiting their regenesis. He is the father, the creator, the son who is still virile, even in passing through the barren regions of Anrutif. In Israel, the solar fatherhood was established in the person of Abram, of Abram. And its token is, or the sign, the milikit, is the covenant of the circumcision made in the blood of of the male, which superseded that founded in the emasculation of the male. So what we have here is there was a former emasculation of the male when the, when the, the, the degenerate goddess diva cults ruled, and then after they were overturned and the fatherhood was restored, now we have Abraham. This is why Abraham is the father of the faithful.
And then there's a curious illustration that Macy notes here in John's Gospel, Moses, where he says, Moses, therefore, gave you circumcision, not that it is of Moses, but of the fathers. This is the words of our black Lord and Savior. He says, Moses, therefore, gave you circumcision, not that it is of Moses, but it is of the fathers or the fatherhood. It was typical of and sacred to the true fatherhood. Atum, the Adam, is the divine father of the Egyptian Genesis who becomes the Adam of the Hebrew Genesis, the progenitor of the human beings. Thy servant is being. Thy servant is being. Now, something very interesting that Macy didn't note here, but the word being, when we trace this, we now have who he. You understand? Or we have Yahweh or Hiyao from the Ethiopic, which means living and being, as the Ehyeh Shara Ehyeh, or Yahweh, Ehyeh Shara Ehyeh means I am that I am, and now speaking of him, one say Yahweh, Yahweh, Yah, Yahweh, thy servant is being, is said to Atum, or Adon, as he descends to create the life of the earth for the Elohim, thy person is typified in Sakari. This refers to the regenesis in which Ptah, the Fetih, fashions the flesh anew, and the deceased becomes a what? A living soul. Now, when you understand this, you have to understand that when it says that and man was formed from the dust of the ground, the proper reading of it is that he was reformed. He was living amongst a tribe of people known as the Afa, but he was spiritually dead. So when we have in the Egyptian Ptah fashion the flesh anew and the deceased become the living soul, in Moses' first book, he speaks about, about Yahweh fashioning this Adam from the dust, the Afa of the land, and he becomes a living soul. I am tomb or the fit tomb, the fit tomb, I am the pie tomb, I am fit tomb, or complete, maker of heaven, creator of beings coming forth from the world, making all the generations of existences, giving birth to the gods, creating himself Lord of life, supplying, supplying the, Elo, the Elohim. So in the Hebrew scriptures, we find two adaptations of the atum the great father. One is as Adam, the Adam, the first blood, and the other is as the Abram, the Abram. It is noticeable that the book of generations of Adam is immediately preceded by the statement, quote, then began men, then began man to call upon Hashem Yahweh or Hashem Jehovah or to assimilate themselves to the masculine divinity. This is what that means when it says in the time of Enos that then men began to call upon the Hashem Yahweh. They began to assimilate themselves to the masculine divinity. They got out of that bitchism. They were in a spiritual slavery, and this is a spiritual Egypt. Abraham or Abraham is apparently a Mesopotamian version of the same divinity as we have in ancient Egypt known as Atum. This is why it said that the faithful woman called their husbands Adon or Adonai or Geta or Master because when the Adon is the Atum. So Abraham or Abraham being a Mesopotamian version of the same divinity as known in Egypt as the Atum, all this makes perfect sense when you understand the wisdom or the mystery of the Egypts because it applies to fatherhood. It applies to assimilation now to the masculine divinity. This was known to the learned among the Jews and is acknowledged in the Kabbalah Denudata, Denu or the Kabbalah Denudata. You understand? Know ye that uh, the scintilla of Abraham, our father, was taken from Mikael. And the skintilla of Yisahak from Gabriel. 
and of Yaakov from Uriel. These are of the substance of Adam Primus, or the first Adam, or what they call the Kedmon Adam, according to the mystery or the secret of repetition. And the secret of repetition is the secret of revolutions of his parts, to wit, of the right side and of the left side and of the middle. So when it talks about the skin, the skin tiller of Abraham, our father, was taken from Mikael, we are now beginning with the right side. And then when it says the skin tiller of Yisahak from Gabriel, we're speaking about the left side. And then of Yaakov or Uriel, we're speaking about the middle. You understand the middle, and, and Yaakov now is now known as Israel by a new name. This identifies them with the solar triad, you understand, or the triunity, the true Jewish trinity, and it localizes their triple domain, their triple dwelling place in the heavens. Thus, our Father who art in heaven part of that mystery as well is disclosed is disclosed right there then as we move a little bit further we have this in keeping with this rendering of the mythos or the ancient mystery the mystery the solar triad that's found in atum in kak or kak and who appear as the three adonaim the Adonaiim, or the my lords, when Abraham says getoch, getoche, in the Hebrew, and the Ethiopic, or the Amharic version. Also, the three make use of the name Yahweh. The Adonaiim, the plural Adonais, they make use of the name Yahweh, whereas in the Bible story, the Hebrew Genesis, Abraham never does. That's why in the New Testament, uh, not New Testament, but in Moses' second book, Exodus, it says that, that he was known as El Shaddai to Abraham, Yisahak, and Yaakov, but not by his name Yahweh. But when the Adonaiin came to Abraham, they make use of the name Yahweh, whereas Abraham, Abraham never does because he was not initiated into this level of overstanding like Moses was. Moses, he was initiated, but not to the level that the great lawgiver Mashu was. So Abraham never uses Yahweh in addressing the Lord. Instead, he uses the Adonaiim, my lords. The narrator says this, Abram stood before Yahweh, and Yahweh spake, but Abram only addresses Adonai and says, Behold, I have spoken to Adonai. Under Abram then was established the covenant of the solar Elohim, the perfect male divinity, and its token, the token of this was circumcision, was circumcision. So there's a greater significance to circumcision than um, one can say easily meets, meets the eye, than easily meets the eye. And even if we go a little bit, a little bit forward here, we have, um, should we take a break for station identification right here? Perhaps we should. So let's take a pause and a break, pause for the cause, and we're going to continue with this on, um, on uh, circum, circumcision, the mystery, you understand, of circumcision. So shalom, ras, tefari, more to come. Stay tuned.